So we'll kick off our webinar. I'm Leah Pappas-Porner with the Calfee Firm, and with me today is my partner, Josh Sanders, and State Senator Matt Huffman. Um, thank you for all uh, that are joined today. Uh, the format for the seminar will be that um, you'll see all the participant, participants will be uh, on mute. Uh, use the question and answer um, icon to post any questions and Josh and I will field them for you and try to get them uh, to Senator Huffman for uh, some questions and we'll wrap up at a, you know closer to the 30 minute mark uh, as well. So I'll kick it off by thanking Senator Huffman for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and willingness to participate. Many of our clients are asking questions about, you know, the state of uh, Ohio's economy, when will we reopen, what will the General Assembly do, all those questions. So uh, thank you, Senator, for joining us. And I will kick it over to Josh to kind of lead us off. Yeah, well, good morning, everybody. And, and yes, thank you, Sarah. And questions are already starting to, to come in and not surprisingly, the first one is, about reopening. Uh, this is the governor has announced that he's developing a phased in approach to reopening. Sounds like we'll hear about on uh, Monday. And how do you see the legislature working to support such a plan? Or do you see the General Assembly working on a different approach? Um, well, first of all, I wanna thank um, Josh and Leah and uh, Maggie for putting this together, uh, being proactive about it. Um, there are some other uh, firms who have actually asked me to do this, uh, but they were the first. So uh, I guess the Calfee lobbyists are always first in line. Uh, uh, when, it, when it comes to being proactive and getting things uh, done, so that's, uh, I really appreciate them asking me and including me. Um, I, I don't think it's a practical matter that, um, especially when you have a scattered non-meeting General Assembly, that the, the General Assembly can come up with a plan. Um, I, I think the, the and, and frankly, um, I th think it's difficult for any government, uh, a central planning authority to come up with a, a specific plan. There's, there are so many different circumstances for businesses and, and different parts of the state um, that the requests uh, and, and things that are coming in, the questions, are, it, it almost becomes white noise there's so much of it. Um, so I think the governor, I understand it, will have some announcements on Monday about the, the kind of approach. And, and I've had some conversations with uh, some of the epidemiologists at Ohio State and Cleveland Clinic about what that may look like. But um, whatever plan comes out, I think is going to continue to change based on additional information that comes in in the next week, in the next month, uh, in the next several weeks. Well, along those lines, are there measures that uh, business owners should be taking now to help ensure that they can be phased in as quickly as possible? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think, and, and I'm a small business owner myself, uh, and, and we've, we've uh, our law firm is an essential law firm. We have closed the door and, and allowed our employees to who didn't want to come to work to not work. And um, some of them chose to do that, some of them chose to stay. Um, but what I would suggest is the same thing you would do in, with other um, issues or problems that you may have in your business, which is plan for the best opportunities. Um, I, I th This is Matt Huffman's personal opinion. I and. There are other people who are smarter than me thinking this, so maybe you want to put some stock into it, but not because I'm saying it. I think we're beginning to discover that the coronavirus is not as dangerous uh, and not as, uh, at least not as dangerous. It may be as, as contagious as many people thought. Um, and, you know, you can read articles in the Wall Street Journal or The Hill or just look at the statistics uh, here in the state of Ohio. So I think as people begin to kind of turn around and say, wow, this isn't as bad as we thought, uh, we may get a quicker turnaround uh, to opening. Now, the, the difference in that may be large gatherings. 
uh, church festivals, county fairs, uh, Ohio State football games, things like that. Um, but I think the best thing you can do is, is to prepare is assume that things are going to come back at least by the time of the schedule that the governor announces um, on Monday and perhaps sooner uh, as more information. A, a statement the governor made to me yesterday was, we're interested in data. And if data shows that we should be doing things more quickly, we want to see it. And I think that data is there now. And I, we, we talked a little bit about it yesterday. Right. And, um, you know, are there things that business owners should be doing uh, to ensure that with a reopening it does not create another uh, peak in the outbreak? Well, right. I, I, I can go through the, the litany of things that we've all heard with the hand washing and social distancing and, and uh, cleaning surfaces and, and doing all of those things. Um, you know, those are probably always good ideas for all sorts of, of uh, problems and, and things like that. Um, I, when I go into a meeting, I think the last meeting I went in with uh, some of the CalFi lawyers uh, a few months ago, um, you're sort of it. You feel like as the politician, you're supposed to go around and shake everybody's hand. And I, I, I usually look at somebody and say, "Is it okay if I don't come around and shake everybody's hand just because that's five minutes worth of handshaking that <laughs> we can get on with the meeting?" So you know, we can change some things that don't need to get done. You know, like Jerry Seinfeld was right when you don't have to kiss everybody you see in your building because you live in the same <laughs> building. Right? I mean, we have to do all that stuff anyway. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that, that, um, all, all of those things can happen. Um, but, um, you know, there are probably things that are, are going to kind of take a cultural change anyway, and, and maybe a cultural change for the better. Mm -hmm. I'm getting quite a few questions on, uh, if you, you know, and again, this is obviously your best estimate. Uh, do you see it as a general kind of opening with, uh, specific guidelines, you know, or more sector by sector, industry by industry, you know, dental practice, yes, you can open, no, you can't, wands, yes, you can, no, you can, or more general. Well, what I, I, as I mentioned, I had two conversations, one with the Ohio State uh, doctors and one with the Cleveland Clinic doctors. And what I've been able to glean from that in conversations with the governor's office is that there's sort of, there are three tiers to this. The first tier being manufacturers or businesses that don't have customers. Uh, so you can control your employees and who comes in and where they go. And the second is uh, businesses that have customers but don't have a lot of traffic necessarily. Maybe a jewelry store or a gift shop. Um, and then the third tier are uh, restaurants and, and places like that. Um, after that, you know, then we're talking about large public gatherings like parades and festivals and things like that. So the, the problem with that is, as that's uh, scoped out at least by the doctors to me last week is that means restaurants don't fully open until mid to late June. And I, I just don't think that's acceptable given um, what we now know about the virus. Um, and I'm urging the governor to do something different. But the second part of your question, Josh, I don't think that the state government can really administer this. It's just not uh, with, you know, you, you can say there are guidelines and restrictions and it's a little bit like education uh, policy when you say, hey, we're going to have this guideline for schools and it works for a school of 4,000 in suburban Cleveland, but for a school of you know 400 in rural Western Ohio, it makes no sense. So um, I'm urging the governor to issue general guidelines, but allow the real application of that to be done on a local level by local public health authorities. Hmm. Um, moving to kind of on the budget side of things. So we've seen the April 10th report from the Office of Budget Management. Uh, we know tax revenues are down well below estimates. Uh, what type of measures do you see as being on the table to ensure adequate revenue to support essential uh, services? 
Well, I, I think the first question uh, before we get to adequate revenue is to begin thinking about where were we spending money that we really didn't have to be spending money. And there are a lot of places, as, as anyone knows, whether it's your personal life or your business, and certainly true in government, uh, if you have money, extra money, you tend to spend it on things that maybe you wouldn't uh, ordinarily, you know, let's, let's go on a nicer vacation or buy a better sea do or whatever people do with their money. Um, and we do that in government too. So um, as an example, um, there's in the education department, um, I, one of the things, and this is just an example, one of the things is that we budgeted $10 million a year for bonuses for schools uh, for the third grade reading guarantee. So if you did really well, you got your school got extra money. Um, that may or may not be a good idea policy-wise in the first place, but the point is we're not given the tests this year. So there's no reason obviously to have the bonus. Now, some people in schools will say, well, give us the money anyway, because we would have done well. Uh, but there are multiple things like that as it relates to teacher evaluations, uh, testing, uh, a whole number of things that weren't done uh, because we didn't have school the last two or three months. Uh, those are specific line items. Um, but, and there are many, many other things. My, my personal uh, issue is, is not personal, but one of the things I had tried to do something about in the budget last year was a, a program called Step Up to Quality, which would have spent about an extra $600 million in the next three years out of the temporary aid to needy family budget line item. And um, I lost that battle last June. I suspect I will not lose it now because, um, you know, that money is needed for needy families and not to pay daycare providers for the work that essentially they were already doing anyway to pay them more. There are a lot of places like that in the budget that we can take out. So now the question, second part of your question is the revenue. And we can't have the revenue we need while the economy is shuttered or largely shuttered. And it won't come back, you know, even if we did all of this on May 1st, we're going to have a devastating revenue situation. Um, so, um, you know, th those are things that, um, you, you know, you really have to get out the, the pencil and the green eye shade and begin seeing what are the things that we really need to pay for based on the revenue that we have. But there isn't going to be the revenue until we open up the account. Mm -hmm. Well, kind of, I guess, along the same lines, obviously the, the speaker came out with their announcement, his announcement yesterday about, about coming back. You know, when uh, the Senate comes back out, it comes back, how, what do you see maybe uh, in tackling kind of early on, or what do you see the, you know, on, your, on your plates going forward? Yeah, there, there will be um, a, a series of um, initiatives. Some of that has to do with how money gets spent that's coming to the state government uh, from the federal government. Some of it is specifically for schools, some for businesses, some of it is just discretionary for governors to spend. Um, so we do have a, you know, almost a mini budget situation going on right now. Um, but there are several other issues. Some of them are specific to industries. Um, uh, I had a, uh, a Zoom call yesterday with the Ohio uh, Hotel Association, and as you would all suspect, they are having a devastating situation right now, and there are some provisions we have regarding non-recourse mortgages, unknown to me till yesterday, that Ohio and Michigan are the only folks who have this law, which may be helpful in dealing with uh, some, some of the language uh, they say may need to be changed. So, you know, we're gonna look at that. We're gonna, I, the president's asked me to talk about uh, liability limitations for COVID-19 uh, and, and how that's affecting businesses. Is that an immunity? Is it a stricter standard? Um, so we're dealing, that, that's one of the things specifically that I'm dealing with. Um, and, and so we're gonna have, you know, uh, we're going to have a real, uh, I, I hate to use the word MBR uh, or the, the acronym MBR, but that's really what 
what this is going to amount to being. And whether that happens in May or June, I think it has to happen fairly soon. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll be going through the same process. So pay your lobbyists more than you were because they're working twice as hard is the message here. <laughs> hey, hey. Boy, that's great news to hear. Yeah. Um, kind of going back to the uh, business owner front. So a lot of businesses have obviously lost employees, even perishable inventories while closed. Uh, it's going to take a long, uh, big effort to uh, reopen and specifically the need to access uh, capital. You know, as federal programs run dry and without further action by Congress, obviously we had it passed yesterday, but it was tough to tell somebody. Is there something the state can do to help business access capital uh, so they can reopen more quickly? Well, I think the, the best thing that the state can do is, um, and, and I'm not, not avoiding your question, but before we get to that, the best thing that the state can do is remove as many restrictions as are practical to operating. Um, you know, governments are, uh, our government in particular moves slowly and moves awkwardly. And we designed it that way because we care about our liberty. And so government is supposed to protect the rights of individuals and entities. Uh, but allow those individuals and entities to operate freely, again, as long as they're not, you know, affecting the rights of other people. Um, so um, I think that's the first thing that the state government can do. Um, the access to capital um, really needs to be, come from our financial institutions. Um, and the, the, one of the problems with that, as, as I'm sure many of your clients know, is the, the liquidity problem. When essentially, if the banks don't have the cash, um, there's, there's no money to lend. So the quicker that, uh, again, we go back to the, uh, the first premise, the quicker that we can get back to um, operating, um, the more liquid people become, the more the banks are able to do things like that. So, that, that's what I think state government can do. Um, so a lot of business owners and employees are at home now with children. Uh, you know, if businesses are going to reopen, um, we will need to address how we care for children, child care, if obviously schools have now been announced to be closed. Uh, how do you see the state reacting on, on that front? Well, um, I don't think the state is, uh, or any government really is in a position to, um, on a massive scale, take care of children. Um, you know, it, I, I talked about the step up to quality issue and, and one of the, th and I'll just talk about that briefly. This was something that was put into law in, in 2012 that said all daycare centers that receive public funds must be part of the step up to quality system and must have three gold stars out of five in order to access the money. Well, a couple of things happened. A number of um, daycare centers, especially uh, daycare centers that don't have all of the facilities and the staffing and the computers and they don't send their people there, they're essentially babysitters uh, who people take you know, to the local church, things like that. They've simply decided we're not going to do it anymore. So a lot of daycare centers are closing, especially for the folks who have the least amount of money. A number of other daycare centers that have a small percentage of folks who, kids who are in there uh, paid for by the government, they simply said, well, we're not going to do all that extra stuff. We're not going to, you know, make sure that we have a child psychologist on board or buy extra computers or, or et cetera, et cetera so that we can have three stars or four stars because our parents don't care about that. They just want to bring it here because this is the church they go to. And so we're not, we're not going to have that extra 10% of kids here because our parents don't want to pay extra to get all of that. And so the, the, you know, again, unintended consequences of government action are we have less available daycare as a result of the step up to quality program. So um, I, I think, um, you know, 
we're, we're, we're essentially in the summer months, uh, and the summer months are going to last five months instead of three months uh, for the school year. Um, but uh, for those who have uh, still have need for daycare, um, what and I think has to do is not uh, overly regulate the business. Obviously, we want children to be safe, things like that. Uh, but we can't overregulate it and put people out of business, which is, I think, what we did with the Step Up to Quality program. Um, a couple more here. I know we're running on time. So um, one is, you know, what else can the General Assembly or what else do you see the General Assembly doing to support institutions so they can uh, reopen, you know, safely and smoothly? And, I'll brag about your what you know. One of the, one of your ideas that uh, I know is out there is on the liquor permit aspect, and uh, obviously a lot of establishments can't be open right now, and one, you know they shouldn't be forced to pay the full amount of the expensive permit. But are other ideas out there uh, like that um, to help businesses kind of get back into being reopened? Yeah, um, and. and you know, I, I, this, I guess I'll put in my usual plug whenever I'm talking to a group is, you know, legislators don't know everything. That's not a shock to a lot of people. We only, we get our ideas from people like Josh and Leah and they're, they're, they bring these things to us and we say, hey, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, the idea about, you know, I don't think liquor permit holders are, should be paying a fee to the state to have a permit when the state's prohibiting them from selling liquor. Uh, that came from uh, one of my buddies who owns a restaurant locally, not from anybody in Columbus. So there's a lot of, of, of those kinds. And, and so if there are specific things, if, if you know, I, I, my conversation yesterday, if a hotel has to pay a particular uh, fee for operating, um, you know, an overnight establishment to the city of Columbus, but they can't, uh, or they're closed down or substantially closed down, those fees, that money should not only not have to be paid, it should be refunded. Um, so, again, this is a lot of amendments and, you know, there'll probably only be one bill, like a budget bill. Um, so those ideas should be coming, um, you know, as soon as possible. And, I, again, I anticipate some sort of uh, late May, early June action on that kind of bill. Great. Well, I have two more here, if, if we can get to them. Uh, one is that it's estimated that Ohio yeah. will, will receive uh, over 4.5 billion from the CARES Act. Uh, and what efforts right. are the General Assembly going to be to make to monitor and uh, you know evaluate the federal funding? Well, um, it's a little like the folks right now who are applying for the PPP. There are people that get it and because they qualify and with them, now we find out that well maybe some people qualify but should they really have it and that's that's true with any uh, government program um, and the fact that this is going to be administered in the amidst a, a crisis and so quickly means that there is going to be abuses in this program so you know we're going to set up you know, whatever the program, we're going to say this is available. We're going to get the money out to folks. It's going to help some folks. Some other people who should get the money won't get it. And there will be insight uh, next year about uh, do we continue this program or that program. Um, it, it, it's very difficult in, a, in, in for any government uh, in a short period of time to do uh, true due diligence on these things because we want to help people. Uh, and, you know, the, the regulation I just spoke about, about not over-regulating, is also what prevents abuses. So um, I think we'll probably end up distributing a lot of money, and, and um, because it's there, that's what governments do. If we have money, we spend it, um, and, you know, do the best we can to, to make sure that it's not abused. Mm -hmm. And finally, have you heard of any issues about uh, supply chain blockages due to cross-border issues? No, I, I mean, personally, I haven't heard anything like that at all. I, I don't know necessarily that I'd be the first person in the information stream, but I, I couldn't speak to that. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I know we're right up on our, our 930. I'll, I'll turn it back to uh, Leah. Senator, thanks for the opportunity to spend some time with you. We'd like to close with 
kind of your um, reaction to your constituency? What's going on in your district? Um, events that have happened, uh, you know, the state is very diverse in its urban and rural settings and, um, you know, the participants that are listening today are uh, from all over the state, but many are from primarily in the Columbus area. So you being up in the, the better corner of the state of Ohio, in your opinion, give us a little feedback about the events and, you know, what's it like in your district right now? Sure, up in the flatlands um, where I live is, um, it, it is substantially different. I, I will tell you that uh, this is just one of the, I represent all or part of seven counties. Uh, in Allen County in Lima, it, it's a little different than the other six. We, it's, it's, we do have an urban center and, and um, but in um, Mercer County, for example, Mercer County, if you look on a, on a map, up against the Indiana border, it has uh, almost always will be the best state, best county in the state in terms of unemployment. Uh, before this, the unemployment rate was about 1.8%, which essentially means everybody who wants a job is working. And uh, the schools, there's usually, you know, three or four of their uh, school districts that are in the top 20 in the state. And they're pretty independent folks. Uh, I think if somebody tried to build a windmill, there might be um, pitch, pitchforks and, and knives and all that sort of thing coming out. We've had lots of windmill discussions, I know. Uh, um, but they have them just to the north in Van Wert and Paulding County and things like that. Those folks, um, uh, right now, there, there's about 41,000 people who live in Mercer County. There are a total of four known COVID. 19 cases. And, and I think they had, you know, tested. And, and I think, as we all know now, a lot more people have COVID-19. We don't know because they're asymptomatic and it's, it's, it's the devastating uh, result that we thought initially. Um, and they're very frustrated because they don't think that what we've done is necessary where they live. They have a very proactive chamber of commerce that is um, at going to all of their business. They have a lot of supplies, um, uh, uh, folks who supply Honda and Ford, et cetera, with automobile parts. They're all ready to go. And everyone's kind of sitting around on their hands saying they won't let us work. Um, one of the high schools had an event with all their graduating seniors where they all took uh, pictures of them together with all the parents there and kind of shrugging their shoulders like if they want to come and arrest us, I guess they can. So that's not good for citizens to have that mindset about what the law is. Um, and that's not just true for Mercer County, it's true for a lot of other places that are um, uh, in this part of the state. Um, I, I gave some statistics before, uh, one of the news media. My, my daughter lives in Battery Park in Manhattan and she and her husband are in their two-bedroom apartment working from home and they go to the bodega around the corner and they don't get around much. That's about it. Well, Manhattan Island is 23 square miles and there's 8 million people who live on it. That's different than Franklin County, which is 540 square miles and has a million or million two, something like that. And in Western Ohio, which has, if you count up the three Senate districts that mine and Dave Burks and Rob McCauley's, that's 25 times bigger, 20 times bigger than Franklin County and we have the same number of people. So it's just not the same. And that's why I've encouraged that, um, you know, the governor to not treat it the same. Um, and, you know, I've seen that approach also being taken now in, in actually by the governor in New York, Florida and some other places. So hopefully, uh, that will be part of the announcement on Monday. Uh, our guys around here, the manufacturers are ready to go. They got their plastic screens up. They got people six feet apart. Um, we have to be careful not to overregulate that because if, you know, one of my guys who supplies to uh, Honda said, look, I can operate at 70 or 80 percent capacity for a few months, but I can't operate at 50 percent capacity. If that's what we're doing, I'm going to shut down. The suppliers to Honda shut down. That means Honda's not making cars in Marysville 
And if they're making them in Monterey, Mexico, or someplace like that, that's real bad for the state of Ohio. I mean, I don't like it if, you know, mom and pop restaurants going to shut down. It's a tragedy for them and their family. But if the automobile supply chain breaks down, uh, we are all in very serious trouble. I didn't mean to close <laughs> no, <laughs> like you. that, we, but I mean, wanted, that's just the facts. Yep. The diversity of the state is really one of the issues that is being discussed. And um, it's why we asked the question, because we're hearing it uh, from our client base. We're hearing it from other legislators around the state. So uh, thank you for sharing that information. And thank you for uh, being our uh, star of our webinar today. We really appreciate it. For all of you that are attending and watching, thank you. Hope everyone and your family stay safe and really look forward to seeing everyone at the State House very soon. Josh, thanks for leading us through the questions. Senator, enjoy the weekend. Happy Friday. Hope to see you soon in Columbus. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe. Thank yeah, you. me too. Thanks, everyone. Thank we'll you. see you. Take care.